Alrighty. <clears throat> well, so we have left off with the French being at war with Austria and with Prussia, uh, two very powerful groups, and we do have a bit of an issue of uh, the French being overwhelmed by these two groups. Um, of course, Austria and Prussia were likely to fight this war anyways, simply because they saw this threat to um, power, uh, specifically of the monarchy, because they you know, just watched uh, a group of poor and middle-class people overthrow uh, the government that they had been under for uh, up to a thousand years before. So uh, it's not great for kings and queens to see their people rise up or anything. Um, so a few months more goes by. Um, we are in late summer 1792, and the war is not going well. And as a result of the war not going well, we have crowds of radical workers and soldiers who are upset, who end up attacking the royal palace where the assembly has met, uh, demanding that the assembly declare France now a republic, uh, and demanding open elections for all men uh, of France, not just those who own property. Um, the Jacobins are going to um, kind of take up that call. They're, they're going to be okay with that, and they're going to uh, push out the more moderate Girondins from power, and they're going to uh, push to take control of the government. Um, the Jacobins are going to be very pro-republic, where the Gerundans were very pro-constitutional monarchy. Uh, by September of that year, you've got uh, demonstrations and violence in the streets. We're talking riots and um, you know people throwing stones, burning stuff. And it's not great. Uh, and this is all leading up to these brand new open elections that the Gerundans have decided that they're going to have. Uh, and the Gerundans are also going to change the name of the legislature from the old National Assembly to the Convention. The Convention turns out to be even worse, even more radical than the National Assembly ever had been. Uh, and they are the ones who end up declaring France a republic now. Uh, and so the Jacobins, there's going to be two phases of their power, uh, kind of the good time and the bad time. Uh, the good time, where they will introduce reforms, um, some emergency measures to try and get the economy jump-started, society uh, pushing for uh, a better war effort. Uh, this is where we see a mass conscription of soldiers for the army. The um, mass conscription, sorry, uh, that is just trying to um, bring in as many bodies as you can. Uh, and you're not really caring about what their background is or what the training is or anything like that. Um, you are just getting as many human beings outfitted with weapons and, uh, and onto the front lines as you can. Um, they are also going to set the law of the maximum where they will fix prices for food and for other necessities. We are kind of starting to see at least a, a touch of that right now uh, here in the United States with uh, this coronavirus, um, this COVID-19, um, because while they have not fixed prices for food or, or anything, uh, we did see a crackdown uh, on the amounts of things that you could purchase. Uh, for instance, toilet paper, for whatever ridiculous reason that everybody seems to think that they are going to need that amount of toilet paper. Uh, whatever the reason, it doesn't matter. The result has been that stores have had to try and limit people to the number of things that they can buy in any one go. Uh, I know uh, Amazon had a crackdown on um, how much Purell uh, somebody can sell. So that dude, if you haven't heard, so a dude in, I think it was Tennessee, they got uh, stuck with like 17,000 bottles of Purell because he bought as many as he could when he saw that this disease was going, or this virus was going around and uh, he thought he could make a buck and turns out, no he can't. 
uh, price gouging is illegal. And uh, he bought it all and tried to mark it up and Amazon said no, uh, which I find hilarious. So, you know, that right there is, is kind of an element of this law of maximum of, of trying to kind of keep things uh, reasonable for the majority of people. Uh, of course, this cuts into the profits of any merchants that are selling goods. Um, so it's really a short-term fix, not a long-term thing. Uh, but still, it's a, it's a measure that, that we will see both here in the French Revolution, we'll see in the World Wars, uh, and we are seeing now. Uh, they also have measures to require delivery of goods and services for the war effort. Um, this was because oftentimes they could not pay for those goods, or at least they had to buy them on credit. And so merchants were not really wanting to give them any goods. Uh, so now you can't say no. You have to give us the goods so that we can use them for the war effort. Uh, and if you don't like it, tough. Uh, and then they're going to persecute anybody who's speaking out against either the war effort or this new convention or uh, any, any kind of challenge to the power base, which I find hilarious considering that's how this whole thing started. It was a challenge to the power base. So they uh, take away that ability uh, and say that, well, dissenters must be enemies of the revolution. They must be pro-king uh, and look at all the terrible things the king has done. Or uh, they must be anti-military. They must be speaking out against our military or our police or, you know, fill in the blank there. Um, they must be bad people. They must uh, be enemies of the revolution. Uh, we see that exact same rhetoric today. Uh, if you've ever watched any kind of TV where a politician shows up, you're going to see that they are wearing that little American pin on their their jacket or, or whatever it is that they're wearing. Uh, and, and if you were to see them without that pin, suddenly they're not American. Well, of course not. That's crazy. But it's all about perception and it's all about what you can convince people if you can convince people that if you don't wear this pin, then you're an enemy, then they'll always wear the pin. The convention is going to argue that these steps are necessary to save the revolution from their enemies and that certain liberties must be sacrificed for security, which always reminds me of the um, response that Benjamin Franklin has to such an argument. Uh, and I am paraphrasing here, but basically the idea was anyone who would give up liberty for security deserves neither. And I always liked that because he's right. Um, under the Jacobins, the French army is going to be very successful. Uh, they are going to suddenly have their supplies. They're suddenly going to have a lot of bodies. Uh, and so they're going to win some s very major uh, victories in the war. And now this war has spread. We are not dealing just with Austria and Prussia. We have other kingdoms that get involved. Now, England is going to get involved for their own interests. That, that's not really about protecting against a constitutional monarchy or anything like that. They, uh, they certainly see the Republic as a challenge to their power, but it's less about power for them. Uh, as far as, you know, whether or not their own people will rise up. And it's more about, we don't like the French. You know? um, for uh, Holland, uh, which would be the primary uh, state of the Netherlands, um, they are going to see this as a threat to their power. And Spain is absolutely going to see this as a threat to their power. So um, Holland and Spain, not necessarily the most powerful militaries out there, but anytime you're adding that number of, of soldiers to um, a war effort, uh, it's going to make, um, make an impact. Uh, and then the French are also going to uh, face many internal rebellions. Um, when you tell people not to speak out, people are going to speak out. It's kind of an element of humanity. Uh, the Jacobins, during this time, are going to end up putting King Louis XVI on trial for treason. Uh, they will find him guilty, and they will behead him by guillotine. Uh, Marie Antoinette uh, will also be executed with him. That is going to happen early 1793. Uh, most of the radical 
groups under the Jacobin leaders ends up taking power in the convention based on support that they can get from local communities made up of well-connected artisans and shopkeepers, basically middle-class people who were lacking political representation, who had money, who had influence over population but not influence over politics. These Jacobin uh, leaders end up getting their support and that allows them to uh, take control within a higher political group um, to be able to expand the power of the middle class. Of course, they're going to do this very quickly and very, very violently. Phase two of the Jacobins in power. Uh, we see the rise of someone named Robespierre, Maximilien Robespierre, uh, and the Committee of Public Safety. The Committee of Public Safety was a dictatorship of 12 men, um, so they technically shared power, but the top guy was Robespierre. Uh, and they were supposed to act as the emergency authority um, to basically make sure all the uh, emergency economic measures are being uh, observed, um, that they were really expected to save the revolution, and, and so they are going to turn to violence as their primary means of saving the revolution. Uh, they will do a, you know, a couple of good things. It's not that they're all bad. They do abolish slavery in the French colonies. Yay them. Uh, that's, a, that's a solid move. Um, but this is also when we're going to see a, a, uh, a shift towards the radical beyond anything that we've seen before. You know, we mentioned at the beginning of this section of notes uh, the author Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine, um, who wrote Common Sense, uh, Driving the American Citizenry uh, into Action for the Revolution. Uh, he wrote the Declaration of... Or, I'm sorry, he did not write the Declaration of Rights of Man. That is uh, the French and, and assisted by Thomas Jefferson. Uh, no, he wrote... Um, Age of Reason uh, and Of Rights of Man. Uh, those were the ones I was trying to think of. And uh, with those two books, he kind of cements himself as a pretty radical thinker, uh, especially one where he's saying, well, Christianity is a lie, um, it, yay deism, there's you know this overall creator and that's it. Uh, that, was, that was huge, that was so radical uh, at the time. And, and, you know, arguing against monarchies entirely is also enormously radical, um, to the point that he alienated a lot of his more moderate friends. Uh, he used to be friends with people like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and uh, Alexander Hamilton, to a certain extent, uh, and, and various other big names in the Revolution, and he alienates all of them uh, with his later writings. That said, he is brought to France, Everybody loves him. Even the moderates are like, oh man, this guy's great. We love this guy. And by the time Robespierre and the CPS takes over, he has been locked up for being too moderate. Uh, so the guy who was celebrated as the most radical of everyone uh, is now seen as too moderate. Uh, that's that's kind of the push that we see. That's, that's that... Um, going over the hump uh, of radicalism there. So they're going to reject organized religion entirely. Uh, they will see the great philosophers as basically saints, as religious figures in themselves. Uh, there will be public celebration of virtues of the Republic, specifically democracy, honesty, devotion to the nation, and subsuming oneself to the general will. Those last two in particular are troubling. Devotion to the nation, that is the beginnings of nationalism. And while nationalism is not inherently bad, you know, being proud of where you're from or something like that is, is not inherently bad, boy does it lead to some bad stuff. Uh, it's kind of step one before you get into the really nasty. Uh, we will be talking about nationalism basically from this point on. Uh, it is going to be an element of stuff that we deal with pretty constantly. 
uh, and subsuming oneself to the general will. I'm always a little uncomfortable with the whole idea of giving up my individuality uh, to follow the masses. We're already cattle. We don't need help. Uh, and then the last thing, symbolic, rational reforms uh, and the changes that will come with that. Uh, the symbolic rational reforms I find hilarious. The, the example I give here, a new calendar that is supposed to reflect nature and recognize the founding of the Republic as year one. So quite literally, they will rewrite the calendar. The calendar that has been used, by the way, for at least... Uh, hundreds of years. Um, in some areas, they are still using the old Roman calendar. So uh, the first like really major calendar that was used in uh, Europe for a significant amount of time uh, was the Julian calendar uh, designed by Julius Caesar. So uh, at this point, over uh, 1700 years old. And people have been using this calendar for all this time. And um, during the medieval period, uh, Pope Gregory is going to end up uh, kind of coming up with his own calendar that in many ways reflects the Julian calendar. There's very few differences to that one, except that it is more Christianized, where they see year zero as being the birth of Christ. Of course, they got that a little bit wrong, but whatever. Uh, he was off by about four years, uh, three or four. We're not 100%. Um, that is the calendar that you are most familiar with. Uh, it is the one that we use today. Uh, of course, y'all ask me almost every year, I've got people that will ask me, what is CE and BCE? Uh, well, back in the 1990s, there was this big push to get away from the Gregorian calendar of BC before Christ and AD Anno Domini in the year of our Lord. Uh, we pushed away from that. We use all the same numbers. We use the same names of the uh, months, and all the months have the same number of days as the Gregorian, except now we say BCE before Common Era and CE the Common Era. Well, the French are going to think that they can come up with something better, and that the founding of the French Republic ought to be year one of this new calendar, uh, which is yeah, going to get a little confusing, especially if you read any of the primary source documents from this period uh, where you're starting to see, uh, year one of the Republic, year three of the Republic. Okay, what year is that? You know, um, gets a little more difficult to keep up with. Uh, we are also going to see a huge push in political repression, where there's this mass campaign against anybody who speaks out, any dissidents who speak out against the government, and those people are going to be defined as enemies of the people, um, enemies of democracy, enemies of the republic. Uh, these people could be identified by their ideas, uh, spoken or unspoken, even their attitudes. Uh, if they just look at a, an official wrong or they don't respond in the correct manner, these could be grounds for, oh, this person must be a dissident. Uh, we will see this come back in the rise of the Nazi party uh, just before World War II breaks out. Uh, this, again, is connected with nationalism. Toe the line. If you don't, you must be an enemy. Counter-revolutionaries are going to be arrested, uh, imprisoned, and often executed by guillotine. Um, a lot of times, if you just aren't radical enough, you might be targeted. Uh, many are the same people that months before this were considered loyal citizens, but because you're not radical enough, because you don't think like us, because you uh, question you might be condemned as an enemy of the state, tried and convicted by popular tribunals, which is a fancy way to say they turn the crowd on you and say, do, you, do we you know, execute this person? Yeah, and then they're dead. And you put them on the guillotine and chop their head off. Uh, nearly 30,000 people are killed in this reign of terror uh, while they are attempting to cleanse the country in order to save the revolution from its enemies. 
and all of this is justified on the grounds of national security. When you hear those words, and you will, there will be times that you will hear, whether you're watching TV or if you hear it on the news or the you know, president says it or something like that, national security, always, always think of this moment. Um, it is a scary set of words that often is used uh, to control. All right, uh, let's hop over to our questions here real quick. Uh, I think we've covered at least a chunk. All right, so number 12, I believe. So how did France end up becoming a republic? Well, um, this is going to be under the Jacobin rise. Uh, and there we go. We have um, this push for the convention. Uh, the convention is elected. They are the ones who uh, declare France a republic. So um, with the overthrow of the assembly, the convention ends up declaring France a republic. Uh, 13. How did the Jacobins change things once they were in power? Well, that's a very generalized question. Um, we're looking for kind of this stuff right here. Introducing reforms, uh, persecution of anyone dissenting, and sacrificing liberties for security. Those are the three things I'm looking for there. You know what, uh, in reading the next question, let's also add a fourth thing. I would like to see um, that King Louis XVI and his wife, Marie Antoinette, were uh, executed also during this time, uh, this Jacobins in power phase one. So make sure that you've got all four of these things here. All right, uh, number 14, describe what Robespierre and the CPS did during the Jacobin phase. All right, so we have Robespierre here, uh, the Committee of Public Safety, who they were, it's this dictatorship of 12 men, but what they did, pushing for uh, emergency economic measures. Uh, they also have a mass campaign against people defined as enemies, they arrest, imprison, and execute counter-revolutionaries. And they end up killing about 30,000 in the reign of terror. So all four of those things. Make sure, all right, cool. So we'll do the next section and then we'll come back to the questions. The end of the radical phase. By July 1794, people are rather fed up with what the convention has been doing. They've been using fear. They've been using uh, the people against themselves to try and keep their power, to try and control the masses. Uh, and if you can keep the masses scared enough, you can get them to do just about anything. Hence, we are not at school currently. Uh, so July 1794, the convention is going to end up turning on this Committee of Public Safety, these 12 men uh, who have been kind of uh, doing all these really terrible things and killing all these people to no apparent effect. Uh, and so the convention is going to name them enemies of the revolution and execute all 12 of them. Uh, that is going to lead us into the third phase, also known as the Thermidorian phase, the Thermidorian Revolution, conservative reaction, all of those things uh, describe this set of about five years, uh, where you're going to see new leaders that ended up ending the Jacobin emergency measures of price fixing and mass conscription. Um, the thing is, it doesn't actually help anything still people are in crisis. People are still starving. Uh, they don't have enough money to hardly do more than survive. Uh, and even then, uh, that is rather difficult. And so in 1795, they end up sitting down and writing a new constitution uh, that reaffirms the rights, but also is going to stress the duties that citizens owe the state. Um, the idea 
we're going to put government in the hands of those with property. Those with property know how to stabilize the economy. And we're also going to prevent lower class unrest by giving them basically a list of jobs that they need to do, keep them busy. Um, this will, will keep them from rising up. And their executive branch, our executive branch headed by the president uh, and various other people that are appointed to positions, uh, their executive branch is now going to be the directory, which is five men who are chosen by the legislature to, uh, to rule. Uh, the legislature um, is is going to pass laws and also select these uh, executives to enforce those laws. Uh, the state is now going to be very open to the idea of using violence against violence. What is that? Violence uh, against a rebellious crowd. Um, for instance, uh, firing grape shot into the crowds. This is where you basically take um, bullets the size of grapes, shove them down a cannon, and fire it into a crowd of people. It basically acts as a massive shotgun uh, that is going to only kill a few. Uh, it's not going to be quite as damaging as like a full-on uh, cannonball or a even a shot fired from a rifle you're not targeting any specific person with grape shot you're targeting a crowd and it's uh, designed to get them scared get them to um, kind of freak out enough that they'll disperse uh, the war that started years before is ongoing uh, Austria Prussia Holland Spain and England all still fighting against France um, somehow France has been able to uh, hold their own, and we see the rise of a new character. Um, he was um, a fairly smart, accomplished uh, cannon commander who was quite good at his job and quite good at um, being able to manipulate politics, uh, and that is Napoleon Bonaparte, now General Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, and he is going to lead the French in some pretty decisive victories, and Prussia and Spain are both going to end up having to pull out of the war as a result of these victories. Uh, by 1797, Napoleon also forces the Austrians to sue for peace, meaning that the original two groups that were fighting are now out. And that basically ends the war. The others had mostly been sending uh, supplies and money, to Austria and Prussia, a little bit of manpower, um, and now they don't really want to take up the fight totally, uh, and so the war is, is done. Um, so Napoleon is going to return a, a hero to the French, um, someone who is beyond popular, because not only did he finish the war, not only are we finally done with this terrible war that has caused so much problem uh, or so many problems in in the french government it he also won so we didn't just get out and and be okay he straight up beat them that's huge uh so he's gonna be incredibly popular um so he comes back to find the new state government very weak the directory with five guys it's not stable. You know, any five dudes are not going to agree on things, and so there's going to be bickering and politics, and they're not going to get along uh, very well, and they're for unstable leadership. Uh, and they're constantly under threat of being overthrown by the far right, the monarchists who want to go back to the old ways, back to the king. Uh, of course, the king is now dead, as are his children. Uh, while they were not put to death, they were put in uh, pretty awful conditions in prison, and so at um, very young ages were um, found dead in their prison cells, uh, most likely from hypothermia. Um, so when uh, Napoleon gets back and he, he finds kind of how things are, uh, and we see even a moment where they take away elections because they think the monarchists are going to elect a new king. 
uh, they're thinking, oh my goodness, we gotta get out of here. So they, they cancel elections. That's not a great great sign. Uh, certainly not a great way to show that you know the the democratic republic is working really well if you're having to take away uh, you know, freedoms and stuff like that. So the directory, um, because of their bickering and back and forth and everything, they know things are not getting done the way they should be getting done. Uh, and so by the fall of 1799, a couple years have gone by, um, they're seeing no improvement to the situation. There are some key members of the directory who are going to decide, you know what, maybe Napoleon should be in charge. I mean, he led us to victory, he's a super powerful dude, he's very popular. Uh, one of the guys who supported this, uh, this overthrow, this coup, um, planned on putting himself in power and at the last second just as he's about to announce okay i'm in charge now napoleon's like mm, no you're not here's here's my gun uh back off and the guy did and i think that's hilarious so napoleon kind of steals it but whatever he was gonna get it anyways uh and he is now the only truly powerful person uh in french government uh november 1799 uh, they are able to seize power. He's so popular, he only has to deal with the incredibly far-left super radicals, the incredibly far-right super monarchists, uh, and he will utterly crush those guys. So it ends up being no big deal. All right, let's jump over to our questions here real quick before we get started on the Napoleonic era. Um, so we have, how did the Jacobin phase end? Uh, well, everyone died. Um, but we'll jump up there. Let's see. End of the radical phase. There we go. July 1794. The convention turns on the Committee of Public Safety and executes their members. Uh, let's see. 16. Describe the Thermidorian Revolution. Um, again, rather open-ended. Uh, but the idea was they had the directory that was in charge of the executive. Uh, the ongoing war uh, that is now under the direction of General Napoleon Bonaparte is finally ended. Uh, and the directory, being unable to provide stable leadership, ends up allowing Napoleon to take over. So, uh, um, overall idea of these four things here. All right, and uh, it looks like we haven't done uh, the rest of them, so let's jump to the Napoleonic era. All right, so Napoleonic era. Um, because he is very popular, um, he is seen as a man of the revolution. He had uh, risen to a position of rank uh, in the government uh, through hard work, through uh, military brilliance. Uh, he was fantastic as a commander. Um, he is going to guide the creation of a new constitution uh, and is going to become the first consul uh, for the next five years. Uh, that, that use of the word consul is very much on purpose. Uh, you may recall um, last semester when we were talking about the Romans, that the most powerful person in the Roman Republic uh, was a consul. And they had two consuls, uh, but eventually there were times where they had only one consul, and the last of the great consuls would be Julius Caesar, who gives rise to the empire. This is very much done on purpose. Napoleon had every intention of uh, consolidating his power getting people to turn from this idea to, of a republic to the idea of an empire. Uh, and he uses this phrasing uh, from the Romans very much on purpose. So for about five years, he is first consul. Then after, a, after this uh, adjustment period, over the next 10 years, he will be the emperor uh, on the French empire. Uh, he is going to do quite a bit uh, once he takes over. He is going to settle a lot of the issues with the nobility and the clergy. 
uh, that had gotten caused back during the revolution. He ends up giving the Catholic Church quite a bit of their power back, but he keeps the land uh, that had been confiscated from them. Uh, but he allows them to kind of do their thing again. So that means the church is going to chill out just a little bit. Uh, and remember, the church, while not nearly as powerful as they had been, are still an incredibly powerful group. Uh, he is also going to make some promises to the middle class, to the working class, and to the peasantry to improve the economy. Um, and he is going to use those new ideas of nationalism, and he is going to use warfare to gain the approval of the masses. If you can show the masses that you are successful in warfare, then you prove to them you will be successful in other areas. Uh, and he brilliantly uh, uses that to his advantage. He is also going to reform government quite a bit under uh, liberal ideas, uh, which we'll get to like liberalism and conservatism and socialism and stuff. I believe it's in the next chapter or it's the one after that, but I'm, I'm thinking it's the next chapter. Uh, he will create uniform codes of civil law and criminal law uh, based on laissez-faire liberal principles. Basically, the government isn't going to interact unless, and then he's got these very general uh, situations. You know, an easy go-to, murder. Don't murder people. If you murder people, then we will come and get you. You know, but if you're not murdering people, eh, we'll pretty much leave you alone. You know, uh, it's an oversimplification, but it's the general. Uh, he is also going to reorganize state administration based on a rational hierarchy and advancement based on talent and ability. That one right there is probably the most important thing that he is going to do. Uh, because up to this point, we have been seeing this, for whatever reason, this design of, well, if you're born into this family, if you are an aristocrat, and remember, aristocracy, the vast majority of them, had their great-great-great-great-great-great-grandpa do something really cool. Maybe they saved somebody's life, maybe they uh, proved that they were this great fighter, or whatever, it doesn't matter. They did something really cool, they got land and title, and all their descendants also get that title. Uh, even if they lose the land, they continue to have the title. And by having the title, that gains you certain privileges. Uh, that was that whole estate system. The nobility, those title-holding people, were seen as better than the peasantry because they were born into these families. They were smarter, they were harder working, they were better at warfare, you know, things like that. Uh, and often those stereotypes were reinforced because since they were nobility, they got education, and because they got education, they were better at these other things. And so you constantly saw this reinforcement of, well, nobility, they know how to do stuff. They're so cool. They did all these, these amazing things. And look at this peasant. He's living in the dirt. So he must not be as good a person as this other guy. So what Napoleon does is say, no, no, we're getting rid of that. Um, you have to prove that you as a person can do some stuff. You need to be able to step up and do those things. And if you step up and do those things and prove to me that you personally can do something, not your kid, not your cousin, you, if you can do those things, you get advanced. And this is going to make France much more powerful, uh, is going to allow them to take on multiple countries at a time frequently and win. Uh, and I believe this is in large part because they were no longer relying on your birth. They were relying on your achievements. Uh, and that's huge. Uh, Napoleon is also going to centralize administration under himself, where he is kind of the top dude. Uh, I mean, he is the emperor, so, you know, shocker. Um, he will reform tax codes, reform education, uh, start pushing for education to kind of go to larger groups of people. Um, he sees education as being kind of the future. If you want to make France really strong, then you have to have an educated uh, group of people. Uh, he reforms those tax codes to hit everybody, not just the poorest of the poor, uh, which, you know, for whatever reason, is a novel idea at this time. And he's going to end up going out and conquering a significant amount of Europe 
and spreading a lot of his reforms. And so while his ideas are great for France, they're, they're great for these other groups too. Uh, now, these other groups are not thrilled with the idea of being conquered, who would be, but they do see positive things from being conquered. Uh, of course, he is not all good. Those are the good things. Uh, he is also uh, a bit of an authoritarian. He uses a, a police force and a spy network to make sure that he roots out anybody that is against him, uh, any sort of dissent or anything like that. Uh, he'll end up censoring the press and restricting freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. Uh, you know, those really important things that we decided to put in the First Amendment of our Constitution because we found them so very important. He gets rid of all that. Uh, he is going to personalize his power by making all people working for the government, all civil servants, they must take an oath to the emperor. Uh, and he's going to base his rule on a constitution which officially gives him power through writing, you know, just like the Americans, just like the Dutch, just like uh, England, to a certain extent they don't have a constitution, but they have writing. Um, but the legislature that is underneath him as part of the constitution doesn't really have any actual power. Uh, he makes all the decisions. And that's never particularly good. As a general, he is going to uh, be very successful. Before he became emperor, uh, he led excursions into uh, Egypt. He ended up basically scaring everybody into joining together. Uh, Great Britain in particular is going to be kind of the number one force to uh, kind of pull everybody together. And uh, this is going to be known as the second coalition against France, the first being Austria, Prussia, and Spain, later joined by others. Um, so Great Britain is going to gather together uh, groups to fight against France in the second coalition. Uh, he is going to have great success against the Ottomans in the area because that's on land, but he's going to lose a major naval battle to the British on the Nile. Uh, and they are the powerhouse in the water. So uh, they end up signing a treaty because the Brits know they can't defeat him on land and he knows he can't defeat them on the water, even though both can challenge the other one in their respective venues. Uh, so they end up signing a, a fairly shaky treaty that is not going to last for a real long time. Uh, once he becomes emperor in 1804, uh, there's going to be some pretty major differences with Britain, um, specifically dealing with trade, and that's going to lead them to create the Third Coalition, and Napoleon is going to utterly dominate in this war. Uh, he will go so far as to conquer the remaining aspects of the Holy Roman Emperor, Empire, and that is going to be the official end of the Holy Roman Empire, this thing that has been around since Charlemagne, in the 800s. So this has been going on for a thousand years and it is done. Uh, and that is ended by Napoleon. Of course, he is going to lose again on the water to the British and this is going to allow the British to form a blockade against France, which is going to limit naval trade. And one of the big groups that the French traded with was the U.S. The U.S. actually had huge trade agreements with both France and Britain. Um, some people wanted Britain more, some people wanted France more, doesn't matter, they traded with both. Uh, the problem, though, is going to be that Napoleon is going to ch shut off any trade from the European continent going to Britain. So Britain, as an island with relatively few natural resources, is going to be in a tight, tight spot trying to starve out France, who has a lot of natural resources, but can't trade, and so this is going to hurt their economy. Britain can still trade on the water, so they can get some stuff, but they're going to have to go to the United States to get it. Uh, this is going to be problematic as well, because France is going to tell the United States, hey, quit trading with England. England is going to tell the United States, hey, quit trying to trade with France both of them are going to end up attacking American ships. And in 1807, uh, Thomas Jefferson is going to make a huge mistake and place a trade embargo against both of them. 
uh, that's going to wreck the U.S. economy, uh, not do a whole lot to France or Britain, uh, and it was a it was a bad mistake. But later on, this is also going to lead to the War of 1812, um, which I'll, I'll mention here in a minute. Um, let's see. You know what? I'm going to jump over and do some questions here real quick. Um, so number 17, what did Napoleon do once he took power? Uh, so let's scroll back up here. Uh, he created, guided the creation of a new constitution, uh, becoming first consul and then emperor. Uh, let's see if I had a specific one. Nope, okay. Uh, and he also reorganized state administration based on rational hierarchy and advancement based on talent and ability. You don't have to write out that whole thing. Um, give me the gist. Uh, but we're looking for this stuff right here. I don't just put like a liberal reformer. That's not enough. You write out um, at least some of reorganizing state administration there. All right. Um, Well, we haven't done the Iberian Peninsula. I swore I had another question in there about uh, the Holy Roman Empire. I guess not. Um, so we will simply move on. No biggie. So Fourth Coalition uh, forms around Prussia, uh, who they they are suffering under French dominance. Um, they are just north of the Holy Roman Empire, which France has taken over. Uh, and this fourth coalition is going to get their butts handed to them. Um, not only is Napoleon going to take over Prussia, he is also going to knock Russia so entirely out of the fight that they won't come back for years. Um, then he's going to go and conquer the Iberian Peninsula and uh, put his brother Joseph uh, in charge of Spain. Um, so. The Spanish and the Portuguese, while they have not always gotten along particularly well, they fought many wars, um, they are going to join together to push the French out. Uh, and the British are going to support them in this, uh, in this fight. And the French are going to ultimately lose these kinds of uh, fights, but it's not going to be enough to 100% um, push them out of Spain and, and Portugal. There will be a fifth coalition led by Austria against Napoleon. They will lose as well. Um, by this time, 1811, Napoleon is in control of most of Europe in an empire just as large as the Roman Empire had once been. He has done in a few years what took the Romans hundreds of years to pull together. Um, no one has seen this sort of expansion of power in so little time since Alexander the Great. So he is like the scariest dude in Europe at this time. Now the French love this guy. Uh, he is wonderful and he is going to institute these, these grand projects uh, for the French. He is going to... Um, put up the, the Arc de Triomphe, um, which let me pull up a picture here real quick. Uh, again, Paris, bear with me. Honeymoon pictures and all that kind of stuff. There it is. And one day it will open. Yes, open it. Okay, here we go. Um, so we have the Arc de Triomphe there. Uh, it's huge. I mean, look at the size of people next to this thing. Uh, there are people on top of there. Uh, you can kind of see their heads uh, sticking up. Like, this is such a massive thing. And, and uh, there's this circle drive around it. Of course, it's this, this huge... Um, monument that people go and visit and everything. I mean, you, you can see the artwork and all that. There's this drive around it. This is also um, along the street. It's actually behind us as we take this picture here. Um, the 
uh, Champs Elysees, uh, which is this massive wide street filled with these great shops and everything um, that was all designed during the time of Napoleon. Uh, and I always, I love the, the story of why they have these super wide streets. Let me pull that one up. So here is the uh, Champs Elysees, and you've got, I mean, huge, huge streets. I mean, there, there's five lanes going one way. Uh, and then another five going the other way. This is absolutely enormous. And while, yes, it does get pretty busy, I mean, it's not like they don't drive on it or anything. You also have these massive sidewalks on either side where there's plenty of room to walk. You can see for a pretty solid distance, uh, just keeps on going. All of this is by design. Napoleon designed this specifically to be able to march his army down these streets in case anybody rose up. And it has been used uh, in that manner uh, for quite some time. It's very difficult to barricade this area. And in a time where barricades would slow down marching armies, uh, where you didn't have an air force or anything that could just bust through, uh, that was pretty important that you had that ability. Um, so these wide streets that Paris is so popular for today uh, were actually a means of uh, control over the population, uh, which I always thought was, was funny. Okay. Um, so Napoleon is going to um, push into Russia, uh, hoping to further extend his influence uh, into Asia, and, and eventually I'm sure he had thoughts of world domination. Uh, certainly back in the early 1800s, before he even became emperor, uh, he sold the Louisiana Purchase, 1803, to the United States for enormously cheap. Uh, it was $15 million uh, at the time, and when we break that down, uh, we're talking pennies per acre, uh, which is just insanely cheap. So uh, we ended up, as Americans, able to double the size of our territory for very little on our part, but he needed the money. He was dealing with uh, an uprising in Haiti at the time. Um, the uprising took soldiers away from Louisiana. He knew that America would be able to conquer it if they tried, uh, so it was better to sell it than to lose it. And he had every intention of coming back and conquering it anyways. So uh, he really didn't see any downside to it. It would, it would give him some cash real quick. Of course, he did not have that ability because uh, he wasn't nearly as, as awesome as he thought he was. So he's going to push into Russia, thinking, you know, extend his influence a little bit further. Uh, and the war started in the summer. It was perfectly comfortable. But problem was, the Russians knew exactly what to do. They had delay tactics. They um, would do holding patterns, things like that, to try and keep Napoleon's army from moving very quickly. Uh, they end up taking over a significant chunk but being unable to make the government fall and make the people submit. And as a result, needed to leave uh, because otherwise they would be snowed in for eight months uh, with no ability to resupply. So they end up turning and they head back to France. But in the process of, hunting, of running back to France, uh, a massive storm ends up blowing through. Uh, they are frozen to death. He loses over 100,000 soldiers uh, to the weather. Yeah, it's not great. Um, so he ends up limping back uh, to France. He himself survived, uh, as well as uh, about um, half to maybe two-thirds of his army. Uh, but they have just been utterly devastated by the storm. And so uh, he is going to try and uh, raise them up. It's not going to work. Prussia and Austria are going to come together. Um, the original members of the first coalition are going to come back together for the sixth coalition. And this time they are finally going to win a decisive victory uh, over Napoleon. And by April 1814, uh, they invade France uh, and force Napoleon to step down. And then he is exiled quite comfortably um, to the island of Elba. So, you know, he's an emperor. They're not going to mistreat him. Uh, he didn't commit any atrocities or anything like that. He was just a conqueror, and, and 
so he was not going to be mistreated in his imprisonment. Um, at this time, England is fighting with the United States uh, between 1812 and 1815. Uh, they will be fighting uh, the War of 1812 with the United States uh, over some of their policies taken during their conflicts with Napoleon. So Napoleon is going to be a pretty major part of American history uh, for sure between the purchase of Louisiana and starting uh, the War of 1812. Uh, both of those are going to see a huge expansion of American power uh, and a loss of European influence over the United States. About a year, not quite a year after uh, being exiled to Elba, Napoleon is going to find a way to escape. And when he escapes, he is going to march back to uh, France, uh, specifically to Paris, and he is going to force the new ruler, the reinstated king, uh, the brother of King Louis XVI. King Louis's son was technically king for a second, King Louis the Eight, uh, 17th, sorry, uh, before he died in prison. And so uh, Louis's brother uh, is going to take control as King Louis the 18th. Um, I don't believe he was actually named Louis. I'd act, I, I would need to look it up to be sure. Um, I feel like he changed his name in honor of his brother, uh, but I might be wrong about that. Uh, I find it difficult to believe that uh, parents would name brothers the same thing. Uh, but Louis XVIII ends up running into exile where he had been during the majority of uh, the revolution, and Napoleon retakes uh, his throne. But he is uh, very short-lived in his control. Uh, Britain ends up very quickly coming together, forming a seventh coalition uh, to fight him. They will officially defeat him at the Battle of Waterloo uh, in June of 1815. Uh, so he was only there for uh, a couple of months. And this time he is exiled to a very remote island of St. Helena, uh, and he will die there in 1821. Um, some people thought that he was possibly poisoned because they found arsenic in his uh, bones uh, when they tested them. Um, but there is a theory, and I always liked this theory, uh, that his wallpaper killed him because they used a particular type of glue uh, whenever they put up wallpaper. This glue had um, arsenic in it, but it was very low amounts. Nobody was going to die from, from this glue unless they closed all the doors and windows and stayed inside for weeks at a time uh, without ever going outside and breathing fresh air. If he had gone outside for even five minutes, uh, he would have probably survived at least for a while longer. Um, but he ended up dying of arsenic poisoning because the paint in the heat of summer would start to peel away a little bit, releasing some of the arsenic gas. Uh, again, had he opened a window or gone outside for even a few minutes, he probably would have been just fine. But he did not, and he died. Um, all right, the last few questions here. What did Napoleon do after he conquered the Iberian Peninsula? Uh, he placed his brother in charge. Uh, let's find the section. There it is. Um, Napoleon then conquered the Iberian Peninsula. He named his brother, Joseph, the King of Spain. That's what I'm looking for. Brother Joseph named King of Spain. Why was the Sixth Coalition able to finally defeat Napoleon? Um, the Sixth Coalition formed after the winter, the Russian winter, had killed a significant chunk of Napoleon's army. So he was weakened as a result of attacking Russia and being, uh, being overrun by the winter. And that's why the Sixth Coalition was successful. What happened after Napoleon was defeated the first time? Uh, he was exiled, quite comfortably, to the island of Elba. What happened with Napoleon just one year after his defeat? He escaped, uh, and he retook his position, uh, and Britain would end up forming a Seventh Coalition to stop him. And where did Napoleon die? He died on St. Helena, the island of St. Helena. 
Okay, so you have made it through. Um, this section, while I realize has taken a couple of hours for me to get through, um, normally would take me at least a week and a half, two weeks to go through all of this. Um, there's there's a lot going on, and uh, y'all know how I get in class. So um, thank your lucky stars. I did not take two weeks to record all of this. I am also going to be very thankful of that. Um, so make sure that you've got all your answers to your questions. Go back and review parts of the video if you need to uh, in order to um, get your questions answered. Now, if you would please, um, you can return to this page with the videos. And if you will take a look at the French Revolution Part 1, French Revolution Part 2, um, I think he does a great job of kind of summarizing what I just went over. Um, certainly it's not going to be quite as detailed, uh, but he is also going to um, be able to give you some visuals to go along uh, with some of the stuff that I was able to mentioned to you but not show so um, it is great for being able to understand uh, kind of what's going on here uh, again I'm not taking a grade over whether or not you watch this particular uh, set of videos I just think it's really good for um, you to have uh, as far as you know, getting to know the information so get those questions in to me if you have um, any questions for me throw me an email. I do get them fairly quickly. I've been getting them kind of all morning um, after Mr. Lapic asked y'all to uh, throw us an email about whether or not you need packets or anything like that. Uh, my phone has been blowing up. Um, so uh, let me know if you've got questions. Hopefully it's pretty straightforward. Um, certainly I, I mean, I've gone through and answered everything so hopefully that goes fairly easily. I have not yet decided exactly um, how we're going to move forward on this, partly because uh, I don't know how long this is going to last. Um, for all I know, it could be the rest of the semester. It could be two or three weeks, and we just don't know. So um, get the work done, get it turned in, make sure it is of quality. I mean, I handed you all the answers, you just have to write them. Uh, so get it done. Uh, I will come up with something. I, I, I don't know if I'm going to have you test on it or, or anything like that, but I'll come up with something. Um, we may just move on um, to the next section. Um, these questions are due, let's see, next Friday. Uh, oh gosh, I don't remember what that day of the week is. Let me check my calendar the 27th um, so for right now uh, unless I make a change on the weekly uh, announcements or anything like that or weekly assignments um, I will update there if there's an update to due date or time or anything like that but for right now assume 10 a.m. next Friday the 27th for all your questions turned in um, after that, we'll, we'll kind of figure out for the next section. Uh, we'll end up doing um, probably the uh, next part of the notes, more than likely. Which, let me pull it up. Next part of the notes are going to end up with the Industrial Revolution and society up to 1848, uh, and then kind of picking up from there, uh, heading to World War I, and of course World War I itself. World War II in the world sense. Um, world War II for sure is going to take me longer to get through. Uh, where I might be able to do these other ones uh, in a week each, World War II is definitely going to take me some time. There is just too much going on. I got too much to share with you. Um, so be aware that one's probably going to be a couple of weeks. Uh, the rest of them should just be a week each, just like French Revolution ended up being. Um, so you'll have a week to do each set of questions. Um, if I'm having an issue with people not turning in their work or anything like that, for one, it just goes in as zeros, uh, but two, that may uh, help me make a decision on whether or not I'm testing and, and things like that. If I do uh, test, it would end up being 
something online, um, uh, a Socrative or something similar, uh, or a take home. I'm not sure. Just thinking out loud right now. All right, so um, I am done on my end. Uh, get your questions done. Make sure you're keeping up with your other classes. Uh, make sure you go outside every once in a while. You know, don't don't be like Napoleon. Don't shut all the windows and doors and stay indoors all the time. Get out, get some fresh air, and have a good one.